morning. We are very lucky that we have Dr. Roger Pierman, the founder of Leadership Performance Systems and Qualifying.org with us this morning. Um, he works with Fortune 500 companies in developing appropriate assessment and development strategies to use human talents to achieve organizational goals. He's been a researcher, writer, and coach for over 30 years, and today Roger spends most of his coaching efforts with executives and teams responsible for large networks. So these activities have led to the challenges of coaching leaders working across cultural, social, ethnic, and generational boundaries. And for much of this work, using assessments such as multi-rater and tools like the EQI 2.0, which have a global presence, are essential to him coaching effectively. So just before I continue going on, I just want to make sure that everyone can, in fact, hear me. So if anyone's still having any issues, just please let me know. So what I'm going to also do is just give you a little bit of a, an update about what Rod is going to be speaking about today. He's going to review key EQ-related frameworks, tactics, and coaching suggestions for using the EQI 2.0 assessment. So if anyone is, has any questions, please send them through. I, by the way, should introduce myself. I'm sorry, I'm Rhonda Eisenberg. I am with MHS. I'm with the Performance Assessments Division, where we do have the EQI 2.0 as one of our assessments, which measures emotional intelligence. So without further ado, I want to turn this over to Dr. Pierman, because he will definitely have a lot more interesting things to say than I do. So Roger, please, I turn it over to you now. All right. Thank you very much, Rhonda. I appreciate it, and I'm delighted uh, that MHS uh, has invited me to participate in your webinar series. Uh, I want to thank all of those folks who are joining us today to, to uh, invite you um, later if you want to follow up with uh, questions. Uh, also, you can ask questions during the webinar. Um, however, the way I typically <laughs> do these webinars and the amount of information I share, I generally do the questions at the end. Uh, if there's some urgent issue, Rhonda will, will interrupt me and let me know that there's a key question that I need to address. Just so you know, um, as we go through this webinar, there's some introductory pieces that I, I want to uh, share with you on the front end, and then there's a piece I call backstage, which has to do with some assumptions that I think as coaches and facilitators um, that we need to remind ourselves of, especially as it relates to coming to emotional intelligence. And then there are five key tactics around um, emotional intelligence and assessment issues um, that I, I want to make sure uh, that I cover with you. So um, thank you for joining us, and thanks again to MHS for sponsoring today's event. You may know my work um, over the years, as Rhonda suggested. I've, I've been at this for some time, and I've been engaged in a whole variety of um, mechanisms to try to communicate some, some ideas around uh, development and growth. And I just simply share this with you to say that um, folks seem to be interested with uh, what it is I'm involved in and what I'm trying to do and where I'm going next in the exploration of the kinds of questions uh, that I have found certainly interesting and, and useful. And one of the things I would say to you is that in, in all the research that I do and ultimately in the writing that I try to articulate as reasonably as I can, that the data are not always elegant and, and no matter how comprehensive your efforts to study and research, um, it's not always complete. So it's an ongoing process. My point being, uh, there is a, a continual flow of new insights that I think uh, can help us elevate the work that we do. And I'm cognizant that uh, the screen did not change. <laughs> So now that you see the range of things that um, I've been engaged in, and, and I thank you for participating uh, in today's work. 
I've been asking the question about who who receives coaching, and I started digging into a variety of uh, resources, and I found that that um, in a global institute of personnel and development, uh, some research that they recently published, which I thought was most fascinating, and they ans ask a series of questions of 10,000 companies that I and organizations uh, reported the answers that I simply wanted to share with you as a part of our um, looking at some key things around coaching emotional intelligence. And, and one is, in fact, uh, where, it, who is the folk who receive coaching? And I thought this was fascinating and no surprise really uh, that the range of people who are receiving coaching is extensive and that in fact uh, what we see um, is um, uh, that all in the leadership ranks people are engaged in coaching. Well, who delivers coaching? And I found this interesting. We know the coaching industry has grown exponentially over the last decade from uh, several hundred thousand coaches now to literally millions of people claiming uh, to provide coaching and a whole array of coaching topics. And it's interesting further uh, in my own work, I would say that I've spent a lot of time helping managers understand what a manager coach is all about, and no surprise uh, that it's a, a key training need as it shows up in organizations around the world in terms of who's expected to deliver coaching. Uh, one of the other questions that they ask in, in that research was really what is the coaching for? And here were the top items that were listed, and no surprise and improving individual performance would be a part of the coaching uh, conversation. Now, you and I know that people, that the definition of coaching has a huge range to it, and uh, there are plenty of folk who would say that if I'm giving you corrective information that in fact I'm coaching you. Um, I would suggest that um, I wouldn't consider that coaching, and I do understand why some would, but nonetheless, um, we know that uh, coaching is, is a term that covers a lot of territory. We, we further know uh, with just study after study after study that indeed uh, the performance issues that managers and leaders uh, and supervisors have at a whole range um, has to do with what are the key derailers that keep showing up in many studies. The poor relationships or, or um, destructive relationships and inability to adjust to changing conditions um, and ineffective team development. And I, I think those are the things that people get a lot of coaching um, to help them improve in those areas. In May, the Harvard Business Review ran, I thought, a fascinating article that I encourage uh, you to read if you haven't uh, read and do not read the Harvard Business Review. This one was on um, the, the Deep Blue Ocean of Leadership, I think, was the title of the article. The thing that I, I wanted to share with you here, which I think is relevant to the exploration of coaching and emotional intelligence, is when they looked at the middle managers and what they actually do, uh, we see that indeed um, where they put time and effort is all around things uh, having to do with detailed job-related activities right down to time they spend with senior managers. And where they spend less energy and less effort is what kind of environment for learning they're creating, uh, what kind of strategy communication they're doing, how they empower uh, folks and coach people in order to, uh, to do the work that they do. And <laughs> we've seen it. I, I cannot tell you the number of studies, and I'm sure you've seen as many studies, um, that have to do with the fact that developing others is seen as a primary objective and seen as something that little effort uh, or, or a good deal less effort is put into compared to other, other tasks. Now there's one other piece about this article that I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on because it relates to a shift that I've made in the way I've been interpreting emotional intelligence uh, assessments and the way I've been talking about the use of emotional intelligence, and it really has to do 
with uh, getting people into a conversation on how they manage energy. If you'll notice in this research they look at time and effort, which is really talking about the energy you put into something over time. And I'm finding that if I get people into a space where we're talking about uh, the way in which you're using your energy uh, to build relationships, um, that we can find, for example, a space for discussion around a couple of key behaviors. We know that, and you've seen it uh, very much, that as, the, um, as a person takes on increasing responsibilities over time, which usually is associated with age, uh, that the demand that's put on them, uh, forever increasing dealing with complexity issues, uh, and the capacity to respond to that demand is certainly diminished for a whole variety of ways. And so the increasing message in organizational life is that the way we're working isn't really working. And it's, it's interesting, everywhere I go, and I, this year I've been to India, China, I've dealt with executives in Africa, uh, Germany, um, and in and, and Canada, and it, the clear and unambiguous message is the level of stress and the complexity of jobs and the demands on people is uh, quite profound, and we need to reconceptualize the way in which we are thinking about our work and thinking about how we are approaching um, uh, our tasks and our relationships. And so one of the, the concepts that I try to communicate is indeed that um, we, we can do something about our energy and we can look at energy as increasing the capacity to do the work that we have. And one of the ways of dealing with the energy is paying attention to such things as um, our physical well-being, our emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, and in my view, uh, an emotional, intelligent conversation is one that engages people across all of those dimensions. And that we have to be clear that the price we're paying for the tasks and challenges in life that we, we have um, is really worth the price. You know, we are creatures of habit, and anyone who's doubted um, how profound habits are uh, hasn't been paying attention to the ongoing research, especially in the last uh, 10 years, about how much effort it takes to change a behavior. Um, and uh, the, the little phrase here, the unbearable automaticity of being, comes from a massive piece of research that was published uh, several years ago that showed that we are so profoundly guided by um, our habits that indeed when we are talking about an increase in uh, an enrichment in behavior or change in perspective, it takes a lot of work. And we know that people are choosing um, to, to go about it in ways that are not always productive as suggested uh, by the cartoon here. We very much need to help people understand that a paradigm shift is probably needed so that we indeed begin to see our lives and to see our work more as a sprinter. And that means that um, uh, we need to be attentive to our overall well-being in, in different ways. It clearly, um, the second sort of key piece that seems to me to be pretty powerful is that as the increasing evidence unfolds on the role of emotions and performance, um, that positive emotions and dealing with our emotions in positive ways really um, is at the core of operating in a new and different way in, in our work and in our life. So I'm finding that I'm, I'm encouraging increasingly as I work with executives and managers and a whole host of circumstances that getting engaged in this conversation of how we use our energy um, and how we are taking care of ourselves is really a vital part of the conversation and it's important that we put emotional intelligence at the very center, seems to me, of that conversation because it is so important to um, moving into a new paradigm. And whenever we are moving into a new paradigm, and we are trying to move people from a uh, less reactive to more intentional way of being, there's some things to be mindful about what is needed. 
and is certainly skill, there's some skill, there's some behaviors that need to be polished or learned, um, and there's the need for a new mindset and, and a m mindset about the way one approaches work or the way one approaches your life in a whole variety of ways. Um, and increasingly I'm finding that tackling the mindset issue is a precursor really to having people be open to the kind of expression they may need to do in a profound, emotionally intelligent way. And one of the ways that I'm trying to get the notion of a mind shift change across to people is I, I, I really um, want folks to understand that we develop a mindset um, and one very practical, concrete way to think about it is, for example, a map, a map of the world, uh, that every map we've ever seen that's been created that's intended to give us some sense of the way the land masses are and the location of countries in the world um, is based on a whole series of ratios, scale ratios, and we assume that indeed we have a good understanding of the way the world is, when in fact, when we start looking at the particulars, um, it's a good deal differently than it may have been uh, presented to us over time. And to get people to pay attention to the particulars of their mindset strikes me um, is, is in so many ways the hard work of what effective coaching uh, involves. It involves us uh, engaging folks in questions to explore and inviting a way of seeing the world in new and different ways. Um, just to illustrate, if you look at Africa in this world image, you cannot get the true size of Africa, which this illustration uh, gives you and is rather breathtaking when you think about the fact that the United States, China, India, Eastern Europe, um, the, you, you, the core of continental Europe, uh, all of which fit in the land mass, including Japan, um, of Africa, which is a breathtaking shift in our mindset in the way we think about the size of Africa. Well, as I said, um, I, I wanted to share with you that as I'm approaching emotional intelligence these days, I'm engaging in what I think of is something that people can get their fingers in, into around how their time and energy is distributed. That being said, though, as professionals, there's some backstage issues that we probably need to be mindful of, and I just want to just reaffirm the importance of these issues and to be mindful of the kinds of things that affect the way we interpret our emotional intelligence uh, materials and the kinds of um, elements that are underneath some of the tactics that I'm going to suggest to you. If you will, um, the, the nine box uh, system is pretty much embedded in a lot of uh, organizational settings these days, but it's typically thought of as a, just sort of an overall look at how a person is doing. And while that's useful, it's also useful to think about it in terms of uh, almost any behavior and or competency that we're trying to pay attention to. And when we start looking at potential, we need to be mindful of what are some of the forces that are at work on any given, any given behavior. And I encourage, in, when I'm interpreting to a group of people or I'm working with an individual, at some level I try to alert the individual that when we look at their particular behaviors and perspectives that indeed there are four huge arenas of influence on our behavior at any given time and um, that's important when we're interpreting a report to ask the kinds of questions that expose uh, indeed are there certain situational factors that are impacting the behavior at the moment? Um, are there lessons learned? Uh, did a person learn a particular way to approach a challenge or task by virtue of some things uh, in their past? Um, what seems to be the contribution of some of their basic makeup, um, some of the, the hard wiring patterns that they've brought into the world? And what kind of learning tactics are they utilizing and as I was say, saying that in the piece, in terms of what I call backstage awareness on the part of us as coaches, 
um, making sure that we probe around the situational influences, um, some of the lessons a person's learned in their particular context and how that's impacted the particular behaviors that we're exploring for their development, uh, being mindful of how their basic makeup plays into the circumstance that they're in, and um, exploring the, the kind of learning tactics that the individual's using, because sometimes the learning tactic or the failure to use a range of learning tactics really is a key part of the reason why things are not working the way um, they should. Now, one of the things I suggested that as coaches we need to be mindful of is, is really in our approach, are we approaching this situation as uh, um, what is thought of as a sort of supporting and enriching capabilities conversation? Are we really looking at the need to add skills, which I, I label that a more horizontal development, um, or is it a much more, uh, in some ways, complex challenge in transforming mindsets, which is more of a vertical way of development? Now, there are some propositions that I believe we need to be mindful of when it comes especially to uh, enriching emotional intelligence related behaviors and th these propositions are uh, evident in all of developmental context and I think sometimes as coaches we forget that the sequence that a person needs to go through for their development um, they may be extraordinarily competent in lots and lots of ways but they are in a space where they're in a developmentally less complex place and they need to become more um, aware, for example, let's just take one particular arena of behavior like listening. Being a better listener um, may require a kind of complexity that they're not used to. And so in a sense they're in high school <laughs> in listening and we need them to get to a gradual level of listening. And be cognizant that um, the development that's involved uh, is going to take different kinds of time and different kinds of awareness on our part as coaches. I'm very um, grateful to Robert Keegan's work and it's useful especially when it comes to the notion of what I think of as vertical development and helping a person shift um, their orientation and one of the ways of, of thinking about the sort of conscious awareness and the, the, the pattern of mind that a person has is indeed what lots of evidence tells us is that most people is really operate out of that third order, that more socialized mind, and moving them into a more self-authored perspective is often what we're trying to achieve as described here. Um, and I would suggest that uh, it's, it's a part of the emotional intelligence conversation uh, that we are having with people and when we're working with them is to help them understand, for example, why mediating conflict um, is a, a key part of um, owning who you are and what you're about and, and doesn't necessarily mean that relationships are lost, but in fact relationships can be in, in, enriched. So the self-authorship perspective is one that engages in the notion of reframing um, perspective and approaches. And I do think, again, as backroom conversation in our head as coaches, we need to be mindful of where the person is. Another backroom issue that I find important to be mindful of is that no matter how well designed a psychometric tool may be, and I'm, I'm very much a, a person who appreciates and respects profoundly the research that goes behind well-designed tools the kind of research that MHS is willing to put into um, the tools that they support. But at the same time, um, I'm also mindful that there's another part of the story, and that has to do with the more ideographic personal uh, development story. So I use these two images to illustrate that both are true, that a person's behavior can be measured and distributed on, on a bell curve, and, and I do think that's, that's the nature of human behavior and also when you look at how human beings distribute their energy in any particular way. At the same time, there are developmental elements to be mindful of that's specific and unique to that individual's journey. 
I also think that as coaches, we need to be mindful in terms of backstage issues and our strategies that um, a person's typical door A response is is really based on the autom automatic nature of the way in which human beings are. And we know that human beings, if you want to understand their motivation, at the core, it's to increase pleasure, reduce pain, and find an efficient path um, so that almost everything we do is really, at the end of the day, very much driven by what we think is an efficient way to be pleasant and comfortable for ourselves and reduce pain as much as possible. And when we're asking people to shift and change, we are probably asking them to take a door B. And that means perhaps being a little uncomfortable as they learn something new. It means trying something out and being comfortable with not being particularly good at it at the moment, but learning how to use it over time. And I just think that um, we need to be, as coaches, mindful and facilitators that when a person is really choosing to do a door B, to make a choice, to go in a different path, um, that that's going to require a different kind of energy and a different kind of attention. Again, as a backstage issue, I think as coaches, um, when we're working with folks, our mindset around emotional intelligence really becomes critical. And I encourage people who are using emotional intelligence concepts to be in a perpetual state of learning around the nature of emotional intelligence and the ways in which is connected to um, the work that we do. And, and I think further as coaches, we need to be mindful that these stages of change and development that a person's in uh, is going to require different kinds of time, different kinds of energy, different kinds of activities in order to go from being aware and to accepting the impact of your behavior on others to choosing to act on it. And one of the things that I think we've pretty much accepted but need to be mindful of is that really and truly whatever model you use, and I do use the EQI 2.0 model and, and a lot of the work that I do, I'm also mindful of the need to, to be uh, helpful with the person to, to recognize that experience is key and 70% of the learning and growth that a person goes through is going to be tied to experiences they have and that sometimes I may have to help them get in touch with some experiences um, to really stretch their um, understanding of, in this case, each of the domains of emotional intelligence as we see um, on this particular model. So as we're doing our work and using a model like EQI 2.0, we also need to be mindful of the end game that 70% of the development effort is going to be based on some activities we engage them in. 20% is going to be based on some of the coaching, mentorship activities that they do in relationship, and 10% on courses and things of that nature. I think that uh, by now people have come to accept uh, the reality that um, emotional energy drives so much of, of our behavior that really and truly we need to own how powerful and how profound um, that energy uh, is in our lives and in the lives of the people that we're coaching. Now, if those are backstage issues, as we get into the notion of coaching and get into the notion of um, actually what we're doing, as I've just shared, things that I think are important, um, that I try to be mindful of when I'm approaching the coaching initiative, especially in, in the range of getting people aware of their emotions, is that front stage, I try to be clear with individuals that we know if we look at the research on emotional intelligence that there really are four huge uh, lenses around emotional intelligence. One being that emotional literacy is foundational, and, and I'm going to say a little more about that in what we do as coaches and facilitators, that we, we need to help a person be cognizant of the foundations of emotions and what emotions mean. 
there are certain abilities, uh, such as the ability to perceive um, emotional shifts in other people and emotional shifts in oneself. Uh, perhaps the best assessment that's ever been created that taps into the emotional abilities that make up emotional intelligence is the Mayer Salovey uh, Caruso emotional intelligence test or Mesquite which if I had time to talk about today, uh, I would. There is, without doubt, a whole realm of interfacing and interacting elements uh, of personality to emotional intelligence. And then ultimately, what are the behaviors that enable us to um, be more emotionally effective, if you will, and constructive in, in our work? So I, I, I'm mindful that when I'm approaching an individual and I'm trying to work with them, as a coach, that I need to assess these kinds of things. What are, um, what's the degree to which they're emotionally literate, they're emotionally aware? Um, what is the, the realm of emotional abilities they bring to the table, and how does their personality interact and influence the behaviors in which they um, express their emotional intelligence. Now, when I think about emotional literacy, I, I really mean that if you look at the core basic elements of the neurology and biology of emotions, we know that they can be grouped typically into these labels. Uh, that some people put a little different word or two on them, but by and large, these are the core emotions and their various blends that we can help a person become mindful of and understand how they play out. It led me to create a series of booklets. One, for example, Emotions and Health, is to help people understand the link between these basic emotions and how they do things to take care of themselves. Another way of helping people see how their behavior uh, plays out in um, uh, this is sort of that outer circle, is to, to when you collect data, and for example, this happens to be um, uh, some data uh, actually from uh, several thousand managers who in different places have been going through uh, some um, multi-rater assessments and um, uh, coaching training, if you will, and you see in red uh, all of the behaviors that they may be rated on that I believe are very much a part of the emotional intelligence conversation. So just uh, being cognizant that w when we are approaching this topic, we need to have several uh, lenses uh, in uh, through which to look at um, the individual that we're coaching. Now I want to talk about five tactics that I think help us uh, in our coaching with emotional intelligence. And one is uh, to be cognizant of the emotional competencies or behaviors that map uh, to a person's ultimate effectiveness in their work and in their life. And that means all kinds of things around being um, having conversations about where a person wants to go and what their goals and objectives are. And if you'll notice, I've used the word feed forward. I'm finding increasingly with the executives that I work with that um, it's, it's really about what do I need for the future. It's not so much about what do I tweak in the present. Now, that doesn't mean that's unimportant. It's just that I'm finding that I can get them more motivated and more attuned to uh, certain kinds of behaviors that will contribute to their effectiveness if I get them to see how it's going to play forward uh, to them in their, in their work. And one of the ways I do this is, for example, using the EQ model. And a very practical thing is if you have not seen the EQI 2.0 report, on page two of that report is this this uh, beautiful um, definition, set of definitions of each of these behaviors. And I use this page all the time. Uh, independent, I can take this page out of a person's report and simply spend time. And often with groups, what I'll do is um, I will take this page out and use it in the group work before they ever see their reports um, to help them get to an understanding of these behaviors. And not only do I ask them, you know, how do these behaviors play out for themselves, but in the spirit of the feed-forward conversation, how, how will these behaviors matter 
um, in their future work. And I think that tactic is really important. Now, now there's an additional resource, and of course, I happen to think it's a good one. It's one that I participated in um, that goes along with using excellent reports, and that's being cognizant of the range of developmental tips that might be useful. There are 54 uh, behaviors covered in, in, the, in this book that has a whole array of, of ways in which it's organized and tips and suggestions. My only point here in passing through this is simply to say, um, along with the reports, you're going to want to have some excellent resources to help a person um, understand how they can become uh, their emotional best. Now, tactic two, if we, if we are getting into the conversation about the behaviors you need to be effective, we need to move to a conversation around what are the kinds of things um, that we can do to evaluate uh, those behaviors. And the EQI 2.0 is a good one. It's a way of, of getting at uh, some key behaviors and understanding of how your behavior plays out in the world, which I think is very useful. Um, and in, in when it's appropriate, having a multi-rater experience is very useful too. And I want to talk about the fact that EQI also has EQ360 um, to, to, to use. And so the thing about this sort of measurement is that it enables us to take a look at the distribution of our behavior as it relates to appropriate norm groups. One of the things that MHS has done which I really like around this tool is the use of different norm groups, which will enable me to have a relevant conversation with a, a manager um, or an individual, depending on the circumstance. And we can begin to look at how they've distributed their energy across these behaviors. And I say it that way because, as I said to you earlier, I've been moving into this conversation about how your behaviors and expression of your energy and your focus um, and getting folks into that space where uh, we're able to discuss uh, the distribution of energy. If you use a 360 like the EQ360, you get at not only um, their self uh, uh, statement of behavior, but also how other people see um, that behavior. And, and as working with managers and leaders, I think um, it's just a vital thing to do. Now, in some cases, the EQ360 doesn't necessarily uh, cover some of the things you might need, in which case uh, another tool um, and another instrument with features that allows a more customization, for example, People Skills 360, um, will, will help you do that. But the EQ360 is an integrated system with the EQI and therefore enables you to achieve some financial um, efficiencies as well as consistency and language in, in your work. Tactic three, and this one I, I, um, I really want to be very mindful has to do with what I call a discovery plan. I have found that um, helping an individual um, explore his or her questions around these behaviors before we get into an action plan is really important. Uh, emotional intelligence is still a new uh, dimension, uh, relatively speaking, and while it's increasing acceptance of, of emotional intelligence as um, uh, a key part of the conversation to elevate working in a new paradigm and in a new way in the world, um, People need some time to discover more about the kinds of behaviors that we're, we're talking about, and, and we need to give them some, some ways of doing that. Well, one of the ways of doing that is embedded in the EQI report, which gives you details around the impact of um, your behavior pattern at work and some strategies that you might uh, want to explore. Also, resources like um, that you'll find in, in my handbook, which gets at uh, some other additional resources to utilize, all of which are in, engaged in helping a person come to fully embrace the kinds of things that may ultimately go into their action plan. And, and I just think that far too often, I've, I, my, my mistake 
in the past, I think, has been to move to an action plan before there was a discovery plan. And they really needed to fully grasp um, the meaning of their behavior and, and what all that behavior is about. So, for example, if in the awareness uh, from the self-assessment, it appears that that um, self-actualization is an area of discovery and exploration they need to do. That really needs to happen well ahead of an action plan of how to utilize those insights and to becoming more effective. Or perhaps um, being emotionally expressive, again, covered by the EQI 2.0, um, becomes really important um, in creating uh, an action plan. And of course, embedded in the EQI report is a handy action plan guide to help a person uh, move in the direction of the kinds of behaviors he or she needs in order to be effective. Now, tactic five uh, is one that, uh, again, is, is a subtle but nonetheless powerful shift in monitoring and supporting learners in EQ-based contexts, if you will, by asking what I refer to as empowering questions. And w one of the things I think too much of the past has been about um, how much has been achieved uh, here and there when in fact um, the energy and the questions that we ask become vital to supporting a shift in perspective, a mindset shift uh, that may be needed um, and, you know, I, I just think increasingly the power of the questions we ask as coaches and facilitators requires us to be ever increasingly mindful that um, as we're helping a person monitor and become aware of their progress that they may be creating, remember that door B choice, they may be creating a door B in their lives, which means constructing a new way of responding to things that requires a lot of, of um, effort. And we need to be in what I think of the most um, empowering way in, in the way in which we ask our questions to encourage the kind of growth uh, that we're looking for because it's it's more than just adding skills it's also helping a person change the way they use their energy move to a new paradigm as I said when I, I started in in this presentation with you it is the case that this conversation is unfolding worldwide and and I just if someone had said to me 10 years ago well when I started using the bar on EQI and in, in the 80s um, and then MHS published it then, and then MHS um, did a massive amount of global research and, and redeployed it as the EQI 2.0. If someone had said to me when I was using this that I would be using it as much or more on an international stage, um, I would have said, well, hmm, I don't know about that. We'll just have to see. Well, indeed, um, this year alone, I've had this conversation uh, in India, in Australia, in China, with executives in Africa, um, in, in, in Europe, and a variety of countries, where this conversation of how do we um, integrate the emotional intelligence perspective and the emotional intelligence sort of, if you will, behavioral enrichment that needs to occur. Um, in an already tight development agenda, and yet it's seen, again, because of the consistent problems or areas of difficulty or things that hold people back um, in their growth and development um, is around their mindset and their behavioral patterns as it relates to emotional intelligence. I, I, I uh, could, could hardly contain my a joy when the president of a company of a major financial institution stood up and said in January to the senior leadership that he had come to the conclusion that the single most important thing they needed to learn to do was to elevate 
their understanding of what emotional intelligence was all about because he had gone on his own journey and discovered that it was transformative. Well, I know um, that there may be some questions that I need to respond to. I haven't had time to pay attention to the flow of those questions. And I, 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 we had that unfortunate technical difficulty. Nonetheless, I have at least presented to you a range of key ideas and things that I wanted to, to put out there to say the things we need to keep in mind in our coach facilitator role. Uh, a shift in the conversation that I'm having that I share with you is a, is a way in which you might find it beneficial in having people explore their utilization of energy. And, and how I'm using EQ-related uh, arenas to elevate this conversation and help people be more effective. And recently, as I come to close here, and I want to invite you to feel free to, to uh, interact uh, and ask questions. Recently, I was asked a question about what is all this coaching stuff going on all about? I had an executive say to me, you know, you, you're doing this training of managers and coaches in different parts of the world, manager coaches as well as professional coaches. What, what is this all about? And I thought about it for a while, and it seems to me that coaching is a strategy of building some relationships that, that really help us um, have the kind of meaningful and emotionally satisfying conversations that people are yearn for in an age where we are in perpetual, I put it, noise uh, between the emails, the smartphones, the, um, the shifting global demands, the matrixed organizations, um, it really has become, coaching has become um, an, an important part of the conversation about how we lead and ultimately our ability to be effective coaches and lead effectively is going to be significantly connected to um, our enhancement, our awareness and enhancement of emotionally intelligent behaviors and perspectives. So let me pause and see, Rhonda, what kinds of questions we have and the time we have left and for those who want to stay on, um, what kinds of questions I can address. Well, there certainly have been a number of questions, Roger. Um, one of the earlier ones was asking if you could define middle manager in terms of level. Are they a leader of people leaders, directors, and above? So if maybe you could just start with that, with that question. <clears throat> uh, I, I, from, I do believe in the Harvard research and in most settings, middle managers would be those people who uh, and in each organization it's going to be a little different. Uh, a middle manager typically is going to have several other managers uh, reporting to him or her, um, uh, or certainly typical team leaders, a number of team leaders reporting to him or her, and they tend to report up into uh, someone of a senior leadership in a arena. Now, of course, that's going to shift by organizational context. Um, I've seen where uh, there are some folks who are middle managers, and that covers everything from a person who's running a department to a person who's running an entire region uh, where there are multiple department heads. Um, questions yet to be specific to the context. I thought we lost you again there, Roger. Um, my monitor says I'm I'm broadcasting loudly. <laughs> <laughs> I think you it said sound went out for there for a second. <laughs> um, okay, so let me just see here because there are a few. Sorry. Um, And just so Another, you know, I don't see any of them. I don't see any questions. So I, I know, and I'm trying to scroll through them here because I'm getting them all. Um, one of the – what connections do you make to the framing of Keegan's developmental levels and various cultural orientations? 
Oh wow, that's a wonderful question. Uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> oh wow, that's interesting. Um, I will tell you that, and I do consider myself so incredibly lucky to work with with people in all parts of the world. That those models, uh, Kagan's model, the the, the mind frame uh, piece seems to me to be pretty universal. When you pay attention to the nature of the conversation, which is based, for those of you who, who've read Kagan and those of you who, who remember in psychology the whole subject-object principle, um, it, 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 it's really a universal state of affairs. What changes, of course, is some of the content and some of the underlying variables. Let's just take one, for example, perception of time. Um, folks in some parts of the world experience time as a layered phenomena. We here in America experience it as a linear uh, progressive phenomena, and that one difference is profound in terms of the way a person approaches a task or a project. And I would just simply say that um, uh, it, Kagan's model still works, but you have to listen with different ears. So I, we've got a few others here. Um, we can I can either send Roger all of the questions, and then maybe we can send them out to everybody. What do you think about that, Roger? Because I'm just taking a look at the time here, and I uh -huh. know how how busy you are, and I, there are still a lot of people on this call. Well, I would be happy to take the questions and prepare a document, and you can post it um, on, the, on the website or send it out to folks as you need to. I'm, I'm happy to do that, and um, that would also give me a chance to perhaps give a little more information than I can at this moment, simply because I know we're constrained for time. And, and folks uh, have things they need to do today. So I'm so pleased that folks joined us and stayed with us, and I'm absolutely uh, really privileged to have this opportunity to share with you and to be a part of what you're trying to achieve here. Um, so why don't we send me those questions, and if you want to, send all of them to me and let me prepare a response, and we'll do it that way. Perfect, and then I will share that out with everyone who has registered for the webinar. So I really do want to thank you for taking the time this morning to, to do this presentation for everybody. I can tell you the feedback has just been fantastic. Everyone was very sad when they thought they lost you there for a bit. So we, I do, again, want to apologize for our little technical difficulties. I guess it just um, follows in with the technical difficulties, Roger, that you said you've been having over the past few days. So unfortunately, computers, you know, sometimes this is why we need to keep humans. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we will send those questions to Roger and then send everything out to all of you. So thank you very much for joining us this morning.